Due to the really positive feedback that we received from our review of The Temptations' fifth studio album, we decided to review yet another album. This time, we're going to review the Mamas and Papas' very first album, If You Can Believe Your Eyes and Ears, released on February 28, 1966 by Dunhill Records. This is Two Sisters in a TV, the classic TV podcast, where we remember and discuss and celebrate all things and everything classic TV. Thank you for joining us again for a brand new episode. And yet again, we're going to go back to our classic TV format next week. But it was so much fun to review the Temptations album. We wanted to do another album review really quickly. And so we decided to review that first album of the Mamas and the Papas, their debut album. Of course, the Mamas and the Papas consisted of John Phillips, his second wife, Michelle, Denny Dordery, and Cass Elliott. This album definitely, I think, their best album. They released five albums of the, over the course of their career. They were together for three years. This, I think, is their best. I like all of their albums, so I like all five, but this, I think, is the best. Because when you listen to it, you could just hear the joy that they all had in singing together. They just really were having a good time. They were enjoying singing together, harmonizing, and just having fun with it. And so there's a joy within this album that was missing from the other albums that they did later on, you know, within their time together. Now, if you want to know about more, if you want to know more about the Mamas and the Papas, there are some great documentaries and biographies on YouTube you can check out. I mean, there's a really good documentary called about Cult Straight Shooter. There is the Behind the Music of the Mamas and the Papas. There is the Cass Elliot biography. I mean, there's so much good stuff. Because honestly, I'm not going to go off into really the history of the group and how they got together and all that, because that would just take up a lot of time. We really want to focus on this album today. Now, doing an episode on the Mamas and Papas themselves, well, that's the thing that we're thinking about doing later on down the road, but we don't want to digress too much and get off into that because, again, there's so much to tell about that little quartet. It would take up a lot of time. So we want to just look at the album. Again, this is where their debut album was released, like I said, in early 1966. The album cover itself, very unforgettable. You've got four people piled up together in a bathtub. And if you look at the original album cover, you have a toilet sitting right there front and center over on the right. Now, of course, we're looking at 1966, a toilet sitting there on an album cover, very scandalous, very inappropriate, controversial, indecent. So that's why on most of the vinyl that you see for this album on the cover, the toilet is covered up. Usually you'll see songs from the album listed, and it's rare to be able to find one of the original covers that has the toilet. If you do have one, you could get a lot of good money for it. If you happen to find one, it is very, very rare. I've checked eBay, and they're very hard to find. I have not found one yet available, but I know one did, did sell at an auction for $300. So it's definitely a collector's item. It's really very valuable on the collector's market. But... Um, this album, definitely just wonderful. Now, most of the material, uh, all of the original material was written by John Phillips or else was written by John and Michelle. There are some covers, but the covers are really good. So like with the Temptations album, I'm just going to go and break it down, side one, side two, and just go through each song individually. The first song on the album is was their biggest hit, Monday, Monday. Monday, Monday peaked at number one on the pop charts in May of 1966. It stayed at that, po- at that top spot on the pop charts for three weeks. It also won a Grammy the following year. The song actually beat out other contenders such as Winchester Cathedral and Good Vibrations. But the harmonies are so amazing on that song. I mean, I can definitely see why it won a Grammy. It was definitely rightfully deserved. Interestingly enough, when John Phillips first brought this song to the other members, they did not want to do it. I think that Cass and Michelle were playing cards, and he played the song, and they just basically laughed it off. They just, you know, dismissed it, snickered at it. 
Uh, Denny didn't want to do it as well. John Phillips could never tell anyone what this song was about. People would ask him, well, what does it mean? And he could never explain it. But the song, again, great way to start off the album. It's a great song to listen to. And like I said, the harmonies are absolutely phenomenal. They're stellar. They're stellar throughout the whole album. But Monday, Monday, definitely something special. And of course, uh, I know Dionne Warwick did a cover of Monday, Monday. Other artists have done covers of it as well. Great song. Now, the second song on the album, on side one, is my all-time favorite Mamas and Papas song. It's my favorite song on this album. It's called Straight Shooter. This, too, written by John Phillips. Basically, he's talking about, some people think it's, a, it's he's talking about, you know, they're talking about drugs. But according to John Phillips' biography, autobiography, Papa John, which was released in 1986, he was talking about Michelle. John and Michelle had a very... Um, how can I say this? Difficult marriage. Michelle cheated on John often. Of course, John also cheated on Michelle. But Michelle, at one point, was sleeping with just about all of John's friends. At one point, she claimed that she'd slept with all of John's friends. And this this song is basically about her cheating. And it's a great song, though. I mean, again, the harmonies are amazing. You start off with John and Denny, and then you bring in Michelle and Cass. It's a great song, a great arrangement. I, it's, again, when I first heard this song, I ran across it. I listened to this song 20 times in one night. I fell in love with this song, fell more in love with the Mamas and the Papas as well, because, I mean, I discovered them when I was probably about 12. But, I mean, the average casual fan of the Mamas and Papas, you basically know them for California Dream and Monday Monday, Creaky Alley, Dedicated to One I Love. But there's so many other songs that you've never heard of before. So when I discovered Straight Shooter, I was like, hey, if they have a song like this, what else am I missing? So I just really took a deep, deep, deep dive into the Mamas and Papas history, and I bought their collection on CD, All the Leaves Are Brown, and I really discovered that they have so much good music. They really, really have a marvelous collection of wonderful music, songs that people don't even know about. Uh, so, but Straight Shooter was, you know, the song that did it. It made me a bigger Mamas and Papas fan. Because now I have, you know, so many of their CDs. I have this album on CD. I have it individually. And then, of course, the entire album is on the All the Leaves Are Brown collection. Which that collection features their first four, their first four albums. So, yeah, Straight Shooter, wonderful song. The next song, also about Michelle's cheating, it's called Got a Feeling. Again, written by John Phillips. Also by Denny Dory. He contributed to the song. And the song is basically about, I got a feeling that you're not being straight with me. I got a feeling that you're cheating on me. And yeah, that feeling was definitely accurate. Michelle was definitely, you know, the cheater. But um, really good song. Fantastic arrangement. It's really terrific. And by the way, I might not, I'm trying to make sure I'm pronouncing Denny's last name right. I think it's it's, it's Denny, Dor- is it Dordery or is it Doherty? I think it's Doherty. I think I'm mispronouncing his name. I've been saying Doherty for years. I need to get the correct pronunciation of the guy's last name. But uh, yeah, I think I'll just just say Denny and leave. I don't want to butcher anyone's last name. So I'll just say Denny going forward. But again, really good song. Classic arrangement. You don't hear it nearly enough. Like on the 60s satellite radio stations, you don't hear this song nearly enough. Never did get... On the classic, you know, oldies radio stations and and the like, you know, over the years, it never did get enough airplay, but it's a really good song. The fourth song is a Beatles song. It's called I Call Your Name. And it's a, you know, it's one of the covers that they did on the album. Great arrangement, castings lead, and then in the song they all come together and they harmonize beautifully. It's it's terrific. It's I haven't heard the Beatles version of I Call Your Name, but from what I have heard. Their version is not like the Beatles version. Their version is really different. But again, it's wonderful and cast has a great job singing lead and the others harmonizing as well. It's it's you know, it's really good. The fifth song on the album is Do You Wanna Dance? This song, of course, was originally done by Bobby Freeman in the late 50s. The Beach Boys covered it in 1965. But this version is a more adult type of version of the song. 
the Bobby Freeman version, the Beach Boys version, but they basically definitely, they sound like songs that, and of course it's not a put down. I like both of their versions, but it sounds, it sounds like something you would hear at a high school dance. Definitely. Do you want to dance? This version takes it to at more of an adult level. It's way more seductive, way more sexy. The arrangement and the vocals, definitely, again, more of an adult-themed version of this song. It's like two grown adults, not, you know, kids in high school, but basically two adults, you know, do you want to dance? So, again, it's a really good version, a really good take on the original from Bobby Freeman, who he also wrote this song. A different take on the Beach Boys version. I think that's on the Beach Boys Today album, their version. I think that's the opening song. I might have that wrong, but I do know that they did cover it. But the Mamas and Papas, their version, again, you know, really good. The sixth song, Go Where You Want to Go, again, written by John Phillips. This, too, was written in uh, regard to Michelle's cheating on John. Michelle had an affair and, you know, basically John, you know, is telling her, you know, go where you want to go, do what you want to do. This song was originally released by Dunhill and Lou Adler to be the very first single released by the Mamas and the Papas. But Lou Adler pulled it and instead released California Dreamin', which, of course, you know, that was a great idea. Go where you want to go. Great arrangement. Again, amazing harmonies. But when the Fifth Dimension recorded it in 1967, it was a top 20 hit for them, and it put them on the path to a really successful career. It was really their launching board, if you will, into success. I like both versions. But I like the Mamas and Papas version better because the Fifth Dimension's version has a key change toward the end, and I don't like the key change. Still a good song, but the key change I could have done without. The Mamas and Papas version remains in the same key throughout the duration of the song. So that's side one. Now side two, of course, the very first track, California Dreamin', the song the Mamas and Papas are best known for. This song, of course, written by John and Michelle, basically talking about, you know, you have a couple, and this was, you know, autobiographical, actually, because John and Michelle were living in New York. John was trying to break into, you know, music writing. You know, John had been, you know, he had been a folk singer and had some bands before, some groups before, but, you know, they were trying to get out of the folk scene and trying to, you know, uh, well, no, they weren't trying to get out of the folk scene just yet. They were still in it, but, you know, John was trying to basically keep his career going, keep writing music, and all of, you know, the music writing capital at the time seemed to have been New York. Michelle was a California girl, and she was really whining about wanting to go back home. It was a cold, windy, dreary day in New York, and she's longing for California. She's dreaming of California, and that's how the song came into being. Now, this song peaked at number four on the Billboard charts in the spring of 1966. It's the song that really propelled the Mamas and Papas into stardom, superstardom, as a matter of fact. They hit really big. This group hit really big, hit really hard, hit hit really fast. This song, of course, has been covered by so many other artists down through the years. It's been covered by everybody from Bobby Womack to Jose Feliciano to The Carpenters. But, and, but also the Beach Boys covered it in the 80s. But it really, uh, you know, it's a great song. You know, Barry Maguire, actually, very close friend of the Mamas and the Papas, he did the song first. It was released in 1965. The Mamas and Papas sing background vocals on the song. If you haven't heard it, go over to YouTube and look it up and check it out. It definitely shocked me the first time that I heard it because, of course, it's, you know, Barry Maguire had a very rough voice. And it just took on a completely different tone. But the Mamas and Papas, they got to the thinking about, hey, you know, we really should record this song ourselves. So they went to Barry and they asked him if it would be okay if they would, you know, could record the song themselves. And so, of course, you know, he was, you know, fine with that. So they recorded it. They took off Barry's vocal and replaced it with Denny's. And, you know, magic hit. 
You know, great song. It's been in so many TV shows, so many movies. And again, it's it's a timeless song. It's a wonderful track. And that flute solo in the middle, you know, really adds to it. In the Barry Maguire version, in the middle you have a harmonica solo. But their version, absolutely wonderful. But I definitely recommend listening at the original by Barry McGuire. The Mamas and Papas, again, the harmonies, their harmonies were terrific in the background. So uh, wonderful song all the way around. I've loved it for years. Second song on uh, side two is Spanish Harlem. That song was originally done by Benny King back in 1961 after he left the Drifters. And also Aretha Franklin covered it in 1971. This version kind of has that Phil Spector wall of sound. Well, Phil Spector did co-write the song. And it has, their version has that wall of sound on it, within it. And you have Denny singing lead and you have Michelle and Cass providing the background vocals. It's a, it's a very haunting version of the song. It's a wonderful song. Their version, again, it's very haunting. And the harmonies, again, they're fabulous. So, you know, I definitely recommend checking this one out. Now, the fourth, the third song, rather, on side two, is another John Phillips compo- composition, and it's called Somebody Groovy. Very appropriate with the times. It's written in 1965 and, you know, it 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 really fits the mid 60s, you know. And the harmonies are amazing. Kaz and Michelle sing lead. They harmonize together. They sing lead on the song together and then you have John and Denny harmonizing in the background. It's a really good song. I love Somebody Groovy. It's a terrific song. I can't tell you how many times I've sang that sor- that song. <laughs> sang that song in the car. I sang that song in the car so many times. It's it's unbelievable. I've lost track. But it's a really fun song to listen to. It is a fun song to sing along with. It's basically talking about, hey, I need somebody groovy. You know, I need someone, you know, to love. I'm going to treat him good when I find him. It's a really good song. And then, of course, you have the fifth song. I'm I'm sorry, the fourth song. I'm 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 getting my numbers mixed up. I apologize. I'm not getting the tracks mixed up. I'm getting the numbers mixed up. The tracks are in order, but I'm really bungling the numbers, and I apologize for that. But uh, the next song is "Hey Girl." Again, this was this was written by John and Michelle. A uh, cute song, great harmonies. Basically, talking about this girl. Her boyfriend has been doing her like crap. And they're telling her that she deserves better. Don't let this guy get you down. You know, get in a good relationship. Move on without him. Cute song. Some would say that it's kind of like filler, but I disagree with that. It fits the the album really well. And like I said, it's really cute. And, uh, you know, I, I like it. And then, of course, you have You Baby. That, of course, was done originally by the Turtles. Their version was released in January. I believe it peaked. I'm not sure where it peaked, but it peaked. In January of 66, I love that song. I love the Turtles version. The Mamas and Papas version is good. Again, great harmonies throughout. Uh, you know, it's I like their cover. I, of course, I do. I must admit I prefer the original by the Turtles. But the Mamas and Papas do a good song, a good version. They do it justice. So, you know, I like their version as well. And then the song, the album, uh, ends with the song, The In Crowd. Of course, the in crowd made popular by both Dobie Gray in 1965. Also, Ramsey Lewis did it. Love both of their versions. And I love the Mamas and Papas version because Cass sings lead. And Cass killed it. Cass did some serious holding. I mean, she really held those notes. I mean, I tried to sing along with that. I could not make it. I could not hold out those. I couldn't hold those notes the way that Cass did. Cass Elliot was a powerful, dynamic singer, and she really was the piece of the puzzle that the Mamas and Papas needed. She was definitely the missing piece to the puzzle. She was definitely the sprinkles, the nuts and and, and cherry on top of the cake and the sprinkles and everything. She definitely made that group even more successful than I think it would have been. I'm not saying that there would not have been success without Cass, 
But I don't think they would have really hit superstardom had Cass Elliot not been in that group. And everyone I've ever talked to about the Mamas and Papas readily agrees with this. And you can definitely see what we're talking about when you listen to her sing lead on the in crowd. Because she's absolutely wonderful. She's phenomenal on that song. And the album, that that closes it out. The album is only 33 minutes in length. It's a very short album. It's not very long. But the album, again, there's so much joy in it. It's so much fun to listen to. The album was actually included in Robert Dimry's 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. And it also has been a part of Rolling Stone's Top 200 Albums. I know in 2003... It was ranked at number 127 on the Rolling Stones magazine, on the Rolling Stones list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And then in 2012, it rose all the way up to 112. Now, on their most recent list, however, because I think they redid this list last year, uh, this album was missing. And of course, a lot of fans were like, what the heck? And of course, I was one of them. You know, they have a lot of new albums on the list and they, you know, I guess they decide to take this one off, which I, you know, disagree with. But, you know, despite what Rolling Stone has done, this is one of my top favorite albums. If I had to pick a list, compile a list of my top 10 favorite albums, this album would definitely be on it. I like all of the albums by the Mamas and the Papas. They had a great sound. But this album, again, they were just starting out. There's so many great tracks. You can hear the enthusiasm within all four of them because they were just starting out. They were beginning to sing together as a group. They were really cultivating and crafting their sound, and they were just excited to all be together and be singing together. And you hear that excitement. You hear the enthusiasm and the joy in each and every song on this album. Not one song on this album, not one track is missing that excitement. And that jubilation. And that's what makes it so special. The other albums that the Mamas and Papas did within their career, within their time together, they're all good, as I said. But that joy and that enthusiasm is missing. You know, there were definitely personal issues that were going on within that group. And although the songs and the albums were still good, the music was still good. But you could tell the personal issues were beginning to seep over into the music just a little in some cases. In other cases, it was more prominent. And again, this is for another episode, for another time, for another day. But again, if you want to find out more about the Mamas and the Papas, I definitely recommend checking out the YouTube documentaries that are over there. I mean, there's so many great documentaries on YouTube about the Mamas and the Papas. And there's some books as well that you can, you know, check out. Like I said, uh, John Phillips wrote his autobiography, Papa John. Released in 1986, Michelle wrote a biography, autobiography as well, also released in 1986. Um, I have Michelle's book. I don't have John's. I do have also uh, the book written about Cass Elliot. I cannot remember the name of the book or the, uh, author's, the author's name, unfortunately, but I have it in paperback. It's a really good book. I must admit that there are a few errors within it, but you know, if you can, you know, dismiss those, a few timeline errors, you know, um, if you can dismiss those, well, then, you know, it's a good book. Definitely. It definitely talks extensively about Cass's life. And unfortunately, there are no pictures in it. That's another, you know, pet peeve I have about the book. Uh, but again, it is a good book about Cass's life. And there's also the oral history of the Mamas and the Papas. That's also available. That's available also on eBay, on, um, Amazon, where you're, you know, reading about the history of the group, not only from the four members of it, but also other people who knew the group and who work with them. So it's really a good book as well. Definitely worth buying, you know, definitely worth reading. But, um, yeah, the Mamas and the Papas is one of my all-time favorite groups. Like I said, I've been a fan of theirs since I was around 12. Of course, I've become a bigger fan just within the past couple of years. And this album, if you don't know anything about the Mamas and the Papas, you want to introduce them to someone else who doesn't know anything about their music, this is the album to play for them. This is the album I recommend introducing their music to because, again, 
Every track is really good. The arrangements, the vocals, the, the vocals, the harmonies are unbeatable. You just can't get better than this album. And I can see why it shot up the chart so quickly in 66 and became the number one album in the country. So, um, yeah, the album again, if you can believe your eyes and ears, Lou Adler actually was the one who came up with the title for this album. Because when he first met them at Dunhill Records, when they auditioned for him, he couldn't believe his eyes or ears. Because they all look like, you know, they again, they look like you know, they came in there looking like four hippies, but they had this angelic sound. And, you know, he couldn't believe it. The way that they looked and the way they sounded, it was absolutely amazing. And, of course, they, you know, definitely one of the groups to rise up the ranks into superstardom very, very fast. You know, like I said, they broke up in 1968 after three years together. But, I mean, they have a fantastic musical legacy, musical history that's still very, very prevalent today. So, again, if you're a fan or if you don't really know anything about the music, you want to introduce someone new to their music, this is the album to go with. And then later on, I recommend, you know, going into some of their subsequent work. But this album... Definitely, I mean, it's the best. It really is. It's a wonderful album, and we were so excited to be able to review it today. And, uh, you know, we hope that you enjoy the review because it was fun to put together, fun to research. And, of course, listening to the album itself is always a lot of fun, always a pleasure and delight to pull out this album and to listen to it from start to finish. Now, next week, we'll be back with our brand new episode. We're going to go back to our regular classic TV format. There's so much more to talk about in regard to classic TV. We'll still review the albums, though. I mean, we are looking at other albums to review. But again, we will do that on a periodic basis. We're still going to focus on classic TV primarily. But it is fun to review an album from time to time. And like I said, with the temptations and the feedback from that, that really gave us a lot of encouragement to keep doing this on a regular basis. But, you know, a sporadic basis basis at the same time. So thank you so much for joining us today for Two Sisters and a TV, the classic TV podcast, where we celebrate all things and everything classic TV and music. And so we'll be back with, like I said, a brand new episode next week. Until that time, we'll see you all then.